Hi everyone, welcome to Digital Transformation podcast series. My name's Kevin Widop, uh, Digital Transformation Sales Lead here at Crown Records Management. Really excited to have Dr. Nick Barretts. Thanks very much for coming on the show and welcome. Thanks Kevin, it's lovely to be here. In terms of this buzzword, digital transformation, just moving off slightly from, from the conversation around data and expectations and mindsets, what does digital transformation mean to you? It's, it's a hashtag that's, that's bandied around here, there and everywhere. It's how we go from one to few to one to many in the way that we push out our content, our services, our education packages, so that when we reach a much larger audience, the transformation I think is partly stock and format, but I think it's also a mindset. And I think it's all about the way we try and provide and deliver services to a much broader range of people. Uh, there's a lot being said around digital humanities, as though that's somehow separated from the rest of the humanities. For me, I find that really unhelpful. Every subject area needs to think digital first, and so digital scholarship is a much better way of thinking about things. So that's another part of the transformation. It's about transforming the way we approach subject areas so that we can make sure we've got the right set of resources and the right set of skills to enable the millennial researcher. And that's a really interesting cultural change within the organisation, within the sector. And then, so the, mil- the millennial researcher, the, the, what, are, what are the characteristics of, uh, of the millennial researcher? You may not see them. I think that's a really important point. It might sound a bit fatuous, but you may not see them. Right. They are going to be there engaging with you, but in a very different way. And so it's important to recognise that in the way that you set your stall out. And a lot of libraries use a website to bring people on site. And there's a finite amount of space. I see that as the other way around. Your web platform, as opposed to your website, your platform, your range of different layers of content and service and skills should be the main business model. And if you then have people coming on site, that's the value add. So it's inverting the whole library model. So it has to be digital first. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we're continually going to respond to the way millennials engage with technology. And I think that's a really important role for libraries. It's to encourage better practice as well. So if people are coming to our platforms from different search engines, once they are there, that's our opportunity to then take them by the hand and lead them through a whole series of gateways where they are skilled up and think about how they can perhaps research more effectively to get more out of the content we're providing. So I think that's really useful conversation with the sector and with the way that we start looking at how we surface content and also those skills because it is going to feel very different. Really really interesting so, so I'm thinking there obviously you've talked about data I've got friends who are data scientists and if you can't see essentially your customer um, how are you harnessing the data or how are you having that conversation with your end user in order to, to improve that experience? Well, I think there are two things. One, we we do have some data. We have the data analytics of their behaviours. And people's behaviours are fantastic. Libraries do this with eye-tracking technology of wayfinding as people move around the physical space. But I think we're using quite a lot of the data analytics of how websites are used and stay rates and linkage follows. That, in many ways, is the digital equivalent of wayfinding around a physical space. So we're beginning to understand a lot more about behaviours. But just as these days the user experience will be co-produced with your user and your professionals, so too the digital environment. And we have to be responsive to what people want. And that's where that data analysis comes in. But like I also said, we also need to then encourage what we see as best practices as professionals in this sector. So the role of the traditional library employment base is also going to have to shift as we bring in more data scientists and digital transformation managers and tech builders who can start to tweak and change these platforms to make them a lot more conducive to how digital behaviour needs to be um, responded to, but also changed and challenged as well. In terms of uh, a digital transformation agenda, are there some key projects that you've, you've got in mind that, uh, that students, the wider public can look forward to? I think the first one is spending three years, I know I said we were conservative, but it's (laughs) going to take that long, to see what we can do as a federation. We've got some very large, uh, effectively, universities out there, King's College London, University College London, I I could name all 18, 
And we are still at the very beginnings of seeing how we can work more collaboratively, more federally together. So we want to spend a year evaluating our collections. What actually have we got? Then we can start to map them out and see those overlaps or collection strengths. And that's when we can, I think, really start to meaningfully have discussions around future development strategy, a common storage approach, and this whole really exciting idea of creating a digital library for the Federation for the rest of the world. I think that's one part of it. But also, we are starting to wrestle with Born Digital and look at how our special collections requirements are going to change. Not just because we know that there is this whole institutional memory that's coming down the track as Born Digital, but the way we as people create our digital selves and our digital outputs in very different ways. The way we have a multiplicity of platforms instead of the traditional academic working papers in their attic or in their cellar or in their room, which are often deposited en masse, which are then catalogued. We're going to have very different footprints and profiles around the digital landscape. And I think what will be fascinating to see how we can provide tools and storage solutions to start to ingest that, not necessarily now, but 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line. It's like I was saying, let's start thinking through those problems now and create the solutions rather than wait for them to hit us and have to then respond and scramble a less effective solution together. So I see libraries at the cutting edge of information management, information storage and information surfacing for the digital future. Wow, and, and just finally thinking about that digital future, what about a digital legacy for, for Dr Nick Barrett at the Senate House Library and the University of London? If, uh, if you could leave uh, a legacy of sorts in, in a digital footprint, what would that look like? Well, firstly, it would be establishing Senate House Library, not Dr Nick Barrett. It's not about me, it's about the <laughs> library. The library comes first. But I think the way I'd like Senate House Library to move is, again, challenging how we reach audiences. A fantastic digital collection with a range of digital tools to help people explore it, to create and co-produce and then add to that. But it shouldn't just be for the narrow higher education market. If you look at the University of London's founding principles, it's to provide education at higher standards to everybody, irrespective of class, colour, creed, at a global level. The library should be at the forefront of that. And I think we can then make education truly democratic and also truly valuable. And it has to be via those digital tools. Nick Barrett on the Crown Records Management Digital Transformation podcast series. Thanks very much. Thank you.